Alright, we're recording. Hello everybody, welcome. Please let me know if you can hear me. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and thank you all for your patience as we get all the technology working here. My name is Sandra Galea, she, ella are my pronouns. And I would like to welcome all of you to the non-traditional first generation college student experience a Woman of Color Perspective. Yo Soy Chafee Tech Talk by Professor Gomez. So, this is our next installment for our Hispanic Heritage Month and we're super, super excited to have Professor Gomez here with us today. So, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce them and then they'll come onto um, the stage and then have their amazing TED Talk for us. Patricia Gomez earned her BA in Sociology with an emphasis on race and social inequalities from the University of California, Berkeley, where she was a researcher and scholar activist. She completed her MA in American Studies from California State University, Fullerton, with an emphasis on race, ethnicity, women's gender and sexuality, and the national and global communities. Patricia's teaching appointments include Comparative Ethnic Studies, Race and Ethnicity in the U.S. Chicanex Latinx Studies, Chicana and Chicano history, and who uses a social justice, woman of color, co-struggler, and black queer feminist lenses. Patricia identifies as a mestiza womanist, Chicana activist, mentor, and is an ethnic studies professor who has worked directly with students from various backgrounds at both the California State University and California Community Colleges since 2017. So let's welcome Professor Patricia Gomez an amazing, amazing individual. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for that really warm and heartfelt introduction. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging on with us with these technical difficulties. I'm gonna go ahead and get started, and we'll begin with the land, labor, and life acknowledgement. So we're gonna begin with one deep breath in through your nose, and then you will release it through your mouth. So let's go ahead and take one deep breath in and out. This land that we inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We pay respect to all indigenous peoples and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. Please repeat after me. Aho. Ashe. Ashe. All right. So, recently I have learned that my ancestors came from a family of educators. And this all depends on how you define educator. In the motherland of what is now Mexico, my ancestors educated indigenous populations in rural areas of Michoacan. They voluntarily taught them to read, to write, and mathematics, specifically mathematics, because cuando los indígenas bajan del cerro y vienen al mercado a vender sus frutas y sus verduras o cosas hechas a mano, la gente no los hiciera pendejos con el cambio. I'll translate. So when indigenous people would come down from the peaks and hills and sell their homegrown fruit, vegetables, and items made by hand, the people would not make them stupid with their change. Let's go, go ahead and see a show of hands, even you out there on Zoom. 
raise your hand if you were a traditional college student, meaning that you graduated from high school and went straight to the four-year. Go ahead and raise your hand. All right, let's make an observation. Good. Okay, put your hand down. And now, raise your hand if you chose community college. All right, look around, make that observation. Good, put your hand down. So according to a study by Yoso and Solorzano, their findings show that out of 100 Chicanx students, only eight earned their bachelor's degree, and of those eight, two earned a graduate or professional degree, and of those two, only 0.2% earned a doctoral degree. It is impossible to close the educational gap. The first time I took an ethnic studies class was in community college. It was a Chicano studies class. Not knowing what it really was, my Puente advisor encouraged me to enroll. I never thought I'd be taking a college exam on La Virgencita de Guadalupe, but now I do the same with my students. So my father was born in Yurecuaro, Michoacán, Mexico. His father was Julio Gomez. He came from a very poor, an impoverished family, experiencing hunger on the daily. His wife, mi abuela, Maria Miranda, came from educated people, y fue partera, she was also a midwife. Julio y Maria tapped into their craftsmanship and handmade Catholic rosaries, living inside their humble home. That's where they had their workshop. Maria attended to the children, helped her husband make and sell the rosaries out in front of the church or in el mercado. They had many children together. A few were still born, sadly. However, eight survived, and my father was the youngest of those eight. My mother was born in Tenayuca, Mexico, in el Estado de Mexico. Her father was Fisóforo Medellín, born in Veracruz, and from French and Spanish descendant. He was the younger of, the of a large family. He was a businessman who owned a factory of metals for indoor plumbing and employed about 300 people in Mexico City. He became an elected official for a party named El PRI, or PRI. And many of his colleagues were also politicians and businessmen during the 1930s to 1950s. His wife was Mercedes Villanueva, or Avis. My Avis was a beautiful singer and dancer named La India Bonita de Mexico, who sang alongside the famous composer Agustin Lara in her younger days. She did not come from money, but her mother would chaperone her to different cities and little pueblitos to sing and perform. Crisoforo and Mercedes were able to sustain their social status for a good 20 years before they lost everything they owned and ended up in poverty. They had six children and my mother was a little child. My parents met here in California in their early 20s. They attended an English as a Second Language course at Santa Ana College in the 1970s. I was raised in a male-dominated machista household and was the only girl in the family with three brothers. I'm the middle child. We were raised with strong Mexican, familial, cultural, Catholic traditions and good moral values. My father dominated us all. He dominated us all in the household, right? He was the one that ruled with an iron fist. He was emotionally unavailable and we feared him. He was hard working, but he also whooped us. It was a household of speak when spoken to Y dímelo en español. Aquí se habla español. You speak Spanish here in my house. My father was intimidating to say the least. 
He put doubt in us and always yelled and cussed. It was not the best environment to grow up in, but I don't regret it. My dad only mimicked what he learned when he was growing up in his household. It's not an excuse, but he was a great provider, so we never went without, and we're thankful for that. Growing up, my mother always had a full-time job. She would get up at four in the morning to go to work, then come home from work, cook an entire meal made from scratch every single day. She would then drive us to our practices because we all played sports. It was football for the boys and volleyball, basketball, and softball for me. After practice, she would pick us up, feed us dinner, have a shower, and she made sure that we said our prayers before bedtime. Hey, yeah! Mi madre es chingona. And has always taught me to be independent, to set goals, and to grow tough skin. She taught me feminist ideals behind my father's back and to not let anything get to me. I am the student that I teach. During my childhood, my siblings and I were all born and raised in Santana, California in the late 70s, early 80s. During a time before white flight hit Santana, we were the only Mexicans on the block. Soon, other Mexican families Black families, Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Samoan families filled our neighborhoods. We walked to and from school every day. It was a far walk. My parents both worked so we were left by ourselves to get ready, to feed ourselves, and leave on time to walk to school, rain or shine. I am the student that I teach. My siblings and I were kept very busy by playing sports all throughout our K-12 public education. We had a basketball backboard hung up above our garage in the alley, and we played pickup games with the neighborhood kids until the street lights came on. I was a total tomboy growing up, and my mother would get upset because I hated wearing dresses and loved to climb trees, shoot baskets, rough house with my brothers, my mom would say, si no se quiere llevar, aguantese. If you're cruising for a bruising, expect one back. Don't dish it if you can't take it. I am the student that I teach. My neighborhood was full of graffiti, gang turfs. You could hear gunshots on the daily, drive-bys, and ghetto birds shining their spotlight through my bedroom window as the police chased down people in the alley. This was the environment outside of my home, and it was a very normal world for me and my siblings. This was our everyday people experience. But inside our home, it was completely a different world. As a little girl, my world was a duality. I am the student that I teach. In high school, although we moved into a better neighborhood, um, it wasn't really much of an improvement. I found my crowd of athletes right away and played sports at first. Then joined the Mecha Club. I became vice president of my junior class and I was even an ASB member. But somehow, my baby Chola would come creeping in and I started to hang out with a different crowd. One that was familiar to me, like in the neighborhood where I grew up in Santana. My grades started to slip. I stopped campus activities, playing sports, and traded it in for ditching parties, going boy crazy, and rebelling against my parents because who doesn't at that age? I am the student that I teach. During my K-12 through experience, I was a student who was disengaged with the curriculum. Academics were torture for me. So my senior year, my GPA dropped below a 2.0. And I faced not graduating from high school. I distinctively remember being in a panic, trying to catch up in order to make it to high school graduation. While in this short-lived mindset of feeling determined to accomplish my goal, my efforts improved my grades in a very short time. I was surprised. I was 
was then called to the office to sit with my counselor at my school and was told that I would be able to graduate with my class the following week. I was so relieved, happy and excited, I asked the counselor for a college paper application because back then applications were on paper. We didn't have internet, right? It wasn't online applying. Anyway, I remember the counselor waiting, the application in the air saying, now Patty, this is the last application in my office. It wouldn't be fair to give it to you and then you don't put it to use. I'd rather much give it to a student who will. I immediately felt disappointed and embarrassed that I even asked. My spirit and momentum were crushed and I left without the application. This told me that college was not for me. I am the student that I teach. I ended up not applying to college that fall semester. I got a job at a grocery store, bagging groceries, collecting carts in the parking lot. My siblings and I were raised to either work or to go to school. And if you worked, you needed to contribute to the home. So I did, I paid my monthly rent, and then in the spring semester, I enrolled at OCC. I took a math class. Probably not the best idea since I enrolled without seeing a counselor first. I dropped out of college after a few weeks, knowing college was not for me, and the doubt of my high school counselor affirmed that this had some truth to it. I am the student that I teach. I met my son's father, a Marine, and was married at 22. I was a military wife. My son was born four years later, and then my son was two years old when we separated. It was a relationship that was violent and abusive, but I had not built up the courage until that point in my life to get out. I wanted to give my son a safer and more stable environment. In addition, marriage in my culture is holy and sacred. There is no out. But after experiencing domestic violence in that marriage and having to take legal action, I had to choose the out. At this point, my little brother, who had just completed his bachelor's at the University of Laverne, had a talk with me. He suggested I go back to school, enroll in college and get my degree. I had always worked and had already made an agreement with myself that college was not for me. But he said, if he could do it, anyone could do it. So I enrolled. I am the student that I teach. Now, a newly divorced single mother and domestic violence survivor, here I was trying to figure out my life as the 30-year-old freshman, which is what I was nicknamed by my brother. I set a goal and told myself that if I got an A in this winter session class, then I would enroll in the spring full time. But if I got less than an A, then college is not for me. I don't know why I put so much pressure on myself when I could have easily earned a passing grade and still continued on this journey. I am the student that I teach. As a reentry community college student at GWC, I was very involved with my community college. I was in the Puente program, I was ele an elected official for the Peace, Mind, and Body Club, and we organized and volunteered in various communities, like in soup kitchens, homeless shelters, we did book drives, beach cleanups. I was able to explore resources the college had to offer, like EOPS, the Boys and Girls Club for child care, financial aid, the transfer center, counseling, tutoring center specifically for math, for me. If I ran into an obstacle, there was always a resource that knew where to refer me or guide me. I gained mentors by showing up and asking questions and allowing um, them to show me how to get help. I ended up graduating with honors. I was awarded the Outstanding Student of the Year Award and also gave the commencement speech at my graduation. And then I transferred to UC Berkeley. 
I am the student that I teach. When I transferred to the university, I packed up my child, he was six years old and in first grade at the time, and we moved to a place where we did not know anyone. We moved to the Bay Area, a six and a half hour drive away from family, from loved ones, and familiar places. My parents were upset that I chose to go so far, but they did not understand why Berkeley was such a big deal to me. They were more upset that their right hand, me, was leaving, but it only ended up empowering them and showed them how to be self-sufficient. My son and I lived in a new place, got to go to new schools, and be without family support. I had to juggle all of that plus my academics, but at UC Berkeley, I grew a chosen family. And this is what usually happens when you move away. You find a way to build community. I volunteered on campus, familiarized myself with resources, and participated in various organizations there. I completed my classes and raised my child. It wasn't easy, but it wasn't impossible. I grew so much during this transition. I got to know myself, I found myself, I claimed myself. UC Berkeley was the hardest thing I ever had to do, but it was the best decision I ever made. Therefore, those lived experiences, the people I met, and the community and consciousness we created will always hold a special place in my heart. I am the student that I teach. To close, as Gloria Anzaldúa says, I change myself, I change the world. I leave you with a little bit of, of advice. Be bold. Learn to say no. Do things for yourself and don't let anyone make you feel guilty about it. Pay it forward. Remember that someone else paid their dues in order for you to get to this point, so return the favor. Help pave the way for someone else. It's okay to fail. No one knows it all, not me, not anyone, so it's okay to fail. It's good to be humbled from time to time. And last, learning is a living process. Learn from your failures and try again. Through it all, I stepped into my identity as a proud Chicana feminista and womanist, a first generation college graduate with sangre mexicana pumping through my veins, a college dropout, a single mother, a 30 year old freshman, a non-traditional student, a lover of life, and now a college professora. I encourage you to step into your identity and own it. Be proud of who you are, whether any sexual orientation, any generation, any race, ethnicity, any social class, any cultural background, documented or not. You are beautiful, you are brilliant, and you are embraced. Thinking back to my ancestors and what they did to liberate indigenous people and their communities through education, specifically ties into my love of teaching ethnic studies and building community. They were working on closing the educational gap way before I was even born. And now I'm trying to do the same. Education for liberation. Now here's my shout out. Cuentista, scholar, Chicana, mentor, activist, professor, mother, daughter, sister, partner, friend, lifelong student, community member, global citizen, Guerrera. Yo soy Chapey. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gomez, for such a vulnerable, courageous, and inspiring um, talk today. Do we have any questions from the audience? While well, I check to see if we have any questions from the chat. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your story and uh, just such a, uh, like she, like Sandra said, an inspiring and um, powerful story. What um, what advice would you give to stu new students who are 
kind of mean to cheat the, um, I just, you know, with the, we talked about regardless of documentation, with the DACA ruling that just happened, um, students who are coming, maybe with that uncertainty, mm -hmm. um, and from your experience, you had so many, you know, great ways of kind of overcoming the obstacles that you faced. What advice would you give students, whether they're in that kind of situation or, or other? Thank you for that question. So my advice to students would be that to persevere, uh, no matter the obstacles. I understand that sometimes there are legalities that hold us back and give us limitations. However, you know, although that ruling took place, I'm sure it's going to take time to process it and they might com combat that ruling. So don't give up. Just, you know, keep your eye on the prize. Keep going forward. There's always resources and, um, and there's always a way, right, to accomplish a goal for sure. Um, and, and the other thing too is, you know, those students can, you know, come to me and ask me how to guide them if they need advice, if they need someone to listen to them, if they need someone to find resource for, resources for them. Um, I'm very open to that. And that's specifically why I gave this talk in this way, because I want to reach them and I want them to understand that, you know, life, life comes, right? Nothing stops it. It's always coming at you. You just really have to know how to, how to deal with that, how to handle that. Thank you for that question. Yes. So you kept repeating, I am the student I teach throughout all these different um, of, like life events. Um, why, why did you feel it was important for you to continuously repeat that as you're going through your life journey? Thank you, Sandra, for that. It's important because I feel in my heart that every section of what I just shared with all of you, um, thank you for allowing me to share, uh, represents what a student might be going through, what a student might be experiencing, right? Um, something that we have in common, something where maybe for me, um, you know, in this speech, I didn't get into detail of how I was feeling when I was going through those obstacles, but maybe it's just a glimmer of hope for them to keep pursuing, you know, um, their degree and their education, no matter what. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Anybody on Zoom? Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> so, Nikki says, Hi, Professor Gomez. That was truly so inspiring. <laughs> what advice would you give to moms coming back to school after a long break? How did you study, maintain your high grades, and make time for your children as well? Hi, Nikki. Thank you so much for such a great question. Don't give up. Believe in yourself, you know. Um, I think that what kept me going, because I can only speak for myself, is that I wanted to give my son a good future, a good foundation, something positive. And I knew that the situation I was in wasn't healthy and that I looked at it long term. Can I, can I live like this for another 10 years, another 20 years? Probably not, right? So I had to make that decision. Um, and, and then also, you know, my son was my motivation. My child was my motivation, so I couldn't let him down, and that's kind of the mentality that I put um, upon myself of continuing to persevere and reach a goal so that I can, you know, do it for him. It's not just for me, it was for us, for the betterment of us. Now, studying, luckily, I had childcare, right? Um, and that might not be the case for a lot of moms, especially if you've taken a break and you're coming back to campus. Um, but I had childcare with the Boys and Girls Club, so it was a program that I applied for, and because I didn't make that much income, I qualified. And so what I would do, because, and this was perfect, because the Boys and Girls Club was on my campus at Golden West College, I would show up, you know, Monday through Friday, drop him off early, and then I would go to my classes, and I would stay where these resources were, right? I would go to the tutoring center, I would get all my homework done, like Monday through Friday, I treated it like a work week. And I would just focus on my study, get my classes done, and then when the day was over, if I had a little bit of time, I would exercise or I would walk on the track on campus, you know, put some miles in, and then pick up my son and we would go home. And then I had the whole, you know, the rest of the evening to spend with him, to put him to bed, to feed him, to do all those things. And so that's kind of how I navigated. Luckily, once I transferred to the university, he was a little bit older and already in school. 
So then they had an after school care program and so I was able to do that. Um, it still wasn't easy, right? Because you're handling and juggling all these schedules and places that you need to be and that your child needs to be, but um, you know, you can do it. You can do it. Other questions? Well, I have another question. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So you shared how your high school counselor kind of implicitly and explicitly let you know that college wasn't going to be for you. Um, and I faced a similar situation in high school as well, oh, where when I shared, I'm not going to transfer to a four-year, um, or I'm not going to go straight to a four-year, I'm going to go the community college route. My counselor stalled and kind of gave me a look like, oh, then you're not going to complete your goal. So. What advice can you give to high school counselors that that can change their perception on the community college system and how can they encourage their students instead of discourage them? Okay, great question. To, talk, to start off with that question, I think that when I was in high school, it was a different time. The majority of my counselors were like 98% white. Um, and that's not to say that if somebody who looked like me wouldn't do the same thing, right? But during that time, there was tracking in school. So they would track you since you were in elementary school and say, okay, you're going to vocational, you're going to university. And so that track was already kind of made before you sat with your counselor, right? And that's something I realize now, right? Um, but, um, you know, those types of situations, I feel that now, you know, the numbers of counselors, there's, there's diversity now. And a lot of them have also gone to community college, so I don't think that it's a stigma as much as it was when I was in high school. And I hope that that's the case mm -hmm. for where you went to high school as well. Uh-huh. All right. Let's see if there's any more questions. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and check. Oh, just a compliment. You're amazing. Thank you so much for sharing from Nikki once again. Oh, thank you, Nikki. Let's see, um, Professor Luis Fernandez, do you have any questions for Professor Gomez? Please feel free to either unmute yourself or drop them in the chat. I don't, but I just want to uh, praise Patty and her commitment. I'm not sure if you be able to hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Luis. Um, I uh, very much respect all of them, and I actually have tears in my eyes, so. <laughs> Aww. Thank you, Luis. Hit, I appreciate that. Yeah, gracias. Professor Gracias. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, then that was what I wanted to share with you all today. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you everybody once again for joining us for this segment of our Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations. Next week, definitely join us for our movie screening and Q&A on two fronts, Latinos in Vietnam. Thank you.